Chapter 41 Birds and Flowers We have been considering in these verses 25 through 30 our Lord's general statement concerning the terrible danger that confronts us in this life arising from our tendency to be over-interested in various ways in the things of the world. We tend to become anxious about our life, about what we shall eat and what we shall drink, and also about our body, what we shall put on. It is appalling to notice how many people seem to live entirely within that compass. Food, drink, and clothing is the whole of their life. They spend the whole of their time thinking about these things, talking about them, discussing them with others, arguing about them, and reading about them in various books and magazines. And the world today is doing its utmost to get us all to live on that level. Take a casual glance at the books on the bookstalls and you will see how all these things are catered for. That is the mind of the world, and that is the circle of its interest. People live for these things and become concerned and worried about them in all sorts of different ways. Knowing this and being aware of the dangers, our Lord first of all gives us an ominous reason for avoiding that particular snare. But having warned us that we must not be anxious about what we shall eat or drink or what we shall put on, He now goes on to give each aspect of the question separate consideration. The first is considered in verses 26 and 27 and deals with our existence, the continuation and sustaining of our life in this world. Here is the argument. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Some people would say that the statement in verse 27 belongs to the following section, but it seems to me perfectly clear that it must, for reasons which will emerge in a moment, belong to this first section. With regard to the whole question of food and drink and the maintenance of life, our Lord provides us with a double argument, or, if you like, with two main arguments. The first is derived from the birds of the air. You notice that at this point the argument is no longer from the greater to the lesser, rather is it the other way round. Having established the proposition on a lower level, he then raises it to the higher level. First of all, he starts by making a general observation, by calling our attention to something that is a fact of life in this world. Behold the fowls of the air. Look at them. Behold does not always carry the meaning of intense gazing. He is just asking us to look at something that is staring us in the face. See what is before your eyes, these birds, these fowls of the air. What is the argument we can deduce from them? It is that these birds are obviously provided with food. There is a great deal of difference between the way the life of the birds is sustained and that of man. In the case of the birds, it is provided for them. In the case of man, a certain process is clearly involved. He sows the grain, and later on reaps the crop that has grown from the seed sown. Then he proceeds to gather it into barns and to put it aside until he needs it. That is man's way, and it is the right way. It was the way that God commanded man after the fall. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. Genesis 3.19 Away back at the beginning of history, seed time and harvest were determined by God, not by man, so that sowing and reaping and gathering into barns is absolutely right for him. He is supposed to do that, and that is how he is to live. That is why the injunction not to take thought cannot mean that we are to sit down and expect our bread to arrive miraculously in the morning. That is not scriptural, and all who imagine that that is the life of faith have misunderstood the teaching of the Bible. But man is never to be worried about these things. He must not spend the whole of his time looking at the sky, wondering what the weather is going to be, and whether he will have something to put into his barn. That is what is condemned by our Lord. Man has to sow. He is commanded by God to do so. But he is to rely upon God, who alone can give the increase. Our Lord draws attention to the bird. There is nothing more obvious about them than the fact that they are kept alive and that food is provided for them in nature, 
worms and insects and all the things on which birds live. It is there for them. Where does it come from? The answer is that God provides it for them. There is a simple fact of life, and He tells us to look at it. These little birds, who make no provision in the sense of preparing or producing food for themselves, have it provided for them. God looks after them and takes care of them. He sees to it that there is something for them to eat. He sees to it that their life is sustained. That is a simple statement of the fact. Our Lord now takes that fact and draws two vital deductions from it. God deals thus with the animals and the birds of the air only in and through His general providence. He is not their Father. Behold the birds, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. That is a very interesting statement. God is the maker and the creator and the sustainer of everything in the world. And he deals with the whole world, not only man, through his general providential arrangements, and only in that way. Then you notice the subtle change, introducing the profoundest argument of all. Your heavenly Father feedeth them. God is our Father. And if our Father takes this great care of the birds to whom He is related only in His general providence, how much greater, of necessity, must be His care for us? An earthly father may be kind, for instance, to the birds or to animals, but it is inconceivable that a man should provide sustenance for mere creatures and neglect his own children. If this is true of an earthly father, how much more is it true of our heavenly Father? Here is our first deduction. You see our Lord's method of reasoning and arguing. Every word is important and must be noted carefully and closely. Observe the subtle transition from God caring providentially for the birds of the air to your heavenly Father. And as we follow his argument in these verses, we shall see that this is something absolutely basic and vital. As we go through life in this world, we notice and observe these facts of nature, as we call them. But because we are Christians, we must look at them with a deeper understanding and say to ourselves, No, things do not just happen in nature. They have not just come into being anyhow, somehow, fortuitously, as so many modern scientists would have us believe. Not at all. God is the creator, and God is the sustainer of all things that are. He provides even for the birds, and the birds know instinctively that it is there, and he sees to it that it is there. Very well then, but what about myself? I now remind myself that I am a child of God, that he is my heavenly Father. God is not to me merely a creator. He is the creator, but he is more than that. He is my God and Father in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. We should reason thus with ourselves according to our Lord, and the moment we do that, care and anxiety and worry are quite impossible. The moment we begin to apply these truths to our minds, fear goes out immediately and of necessity. That, then, is our first deduction from this general observation of nature, and we must hold on to it. God is our Heavenly Father if we are truly Christian. We must add that, because all that we are considering— applies only to Christians. Indeed, we can go further and say that although God does deal in a providential manner with the whole of mankind, as we have seen in the previous chapter where he says that God maketh his sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust, these specific statements of our Lord's here are for God's children only, for those who are children of their heavenly Father in and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it is only the man who is a Christian who knows God to be his father. The Apostle Paul in the Epistle to the Romans says that no man but a Christian can say, Abba, Father. No man, unless the Holy Spirit dwells in him, really knows God as his father and can rely upon him. But, says our Lord, if you are in that relationship, then you must realize it is a sin for you to be anxious and worried. Because God is your heavenly Father, and if he takes care of the birds, how much greater will be his care for you? Our Lord puts his second deduction in these words, Are ye not much better than they? 
Here again is this argument from the lesser to the greater. It means, as it is put elsewhere, of how much greater value are you than the birds of the air. This is the argument which derives from the true greatness and dignity of man, and especially the Christian man. Here we can only work out the mechanics of the argument. We shall have to take it on a deeper level later. But we must say now that there is nothing more remarkable in the whole of biblical doctrine than the doctrine of man, this emphasis on the greatness and dignity of man. One of the ultimate objections to the godless, sinful, unchristian life is that it is an insult to man. The world thinks that it is making much of man. It talks about human greatness and suggests that the Bible and its teaching humble and humiliate human nature. The truth is, of course, precisely the opposite. True human greatness has tended to disappear as the biblical view of man has waned, for even at its best and highest, the worldly, naturalistic view of man is unworthy. Here is true greatness and dignity. Man, made in the image of God, and therefore in some sense like God the Master and Lord of creation. Our Lord comes in a humble, lowly manner. But it is as you look at Him that you see the true greatness of man. Though He was born in a stable and placed in a manger, it is there, not in King's palaces, that we see the true dignity of man. The world has a false idea of greatness and dignity. To find the true conception of man, you must go to Psalm 8 and other places in Scripture. Above all, you must look at the Lord Jesus Christ and look also at the New Testament picture of a man in Christ made after his image. Then you will see the true relevance of this argument from the lesser to the greater. Are ye not much better than they? But God takes care of these birds. They have a value. They are precious in his sight. Has he not said that not one of them can fall to the ground without your heavenly Father knowing? If that is true, then look at yourself and realize that you are in the sight of God. Remember that he sees you as his child in the Lord Jesus Christ, and once and forever you will cease to be concerned and worried and anxious about these things. When you see yourself as his child, then you will know that God will inevitably care for you. There is, however, a second argument implied in this first one, an argument based upon the uselessness and futility of worry. These are our Lord's words. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? This is an argument which we must follow very carefully. To begin with, we must determine what exactly the statement is saying. And here we have two main opinions. When we ask what is the meaning of this term stature, we find that there are two possible answers. Half the authorities say that stature means height, and normally when we talk about stature, we think of height. But the Greek word used for stature also means length or duration of life, and it is used in both senses in scriptural as well as in classical Greek. So it is no use asking, what does the Greek say? Because it does not say. The word may be used in either sense. So we cannot decide it in terms of the Greek. How, then, do we approach it? The context surely must determine and decide this matter. What is a cubit? It happens to be 18 inches, and bearing that in mind, this mention here of stature simply cannot mean height. It is quite impossible, for the reason that our Lord is again working from the lesser to the greater. Can you imagine anybody being anxiously concerned to add 18 inches to his height? The suggestion is ridiculous. It cannot refer to height. It must refer to duration of life. This is what our Lord is saying. How many of you, by taking all this trouble and care, and by being so worried and anxious, can extend the length of your life even by a moment? We talk about the span of life, and that is the argument which our Lord is using, for He is still concerned here about our life in this world. The original statement is, take no thought for your life. He is not considering the body. He is considering existence, 
the continuance of life in this world. The introduction of the idea of height into the teaching here would be a complete irrelevance. No, our Lord is referring in this verse to the duration and extension of life. And it is because of their obsession with this that so many people become worried about their bodily needs. They desire to extend their life. Now then, says our Lord in effect, face this question, face this argument. With all that you do, with all your tremendous efforts, with all your trouble and anxiety, is there any one of you that can extend the span of life by even a moment? And the answer to that question is that we cannot. That is one of the things which are so obvious, but which we all tend to forget. We do not remind ourselves of it as we should, but it is incontrovertibly true. The fact is that we cannot extend our lives in this world, though we may try to do so in various ways. The millionaire can buy all the food and drink he wants, but he cannot extend his life. We are told that money is power. Perhaps it is in many respects, but not in this. The millionaire has no advantage over the most wretched pauper in existence. We can go further. Medical knowledge and skill cannot extend life. We think they can, but that is because we do not know. These things are all determined by God, and thus even medical men are often bewildered and frustrated. Two patients who appear to be in the same condition are given identical treatment. One recovers, the other dies. What is the answer? The answer is that no man can add one cubit to his duration of life. It is a great mystery, but we cannot escape it. Our times are in the hands of God, and do what we will, with all our food and drink and our medical profession and all our learning and science and skill, we cannot add a fraction to the duration of a man's life. In spite of all modern advances in knowledge, our times are still in the hands of God. And so, our Lord argues, why all the fuss and bother? Why all the excitement? Why all this worry and anxiety? Life is a gift from God. He starts it, and He determines the end of it. He sustains it, and we are in His hands. Therefore, when you tend to become worried and anxious, just pull yourself up at once and say, I cannot start or continue or end life. All this is entirely in His hands. If that greater thing is there in His control, I can leave the lesser also to him. You cannot extend your life even by one cubit. Therefore, recognize the utter futility and waste of time and energy involved in worrying about these things. Do your work, sow, reap, and gather into barns. But remember that the remainder is in the hands of God. You may have the finest seed you can buy on the market. You may have the best plow and everything necessary in the sowing. But if God withheld the sun and the rain, you would not have a crop. God is ultimately behind it all. Man has his place in his work, but it is God that giveth the increase. This is what we must always remember, and it applies always and in all circumstances. But we must now turn our attention to the section which starts at verse 28. And why take ye thought for raiment? Here is the second matter, the body and its clothing. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith. Again, the argument is from the lesser to the greater. Again, we are asked to observe a fact of nature. But this time he uses a slightly stronger term. It was, behold the fowls. Now it is, consider the lilies of the field. He means, of course, that we must meditate about these things and consider them on a deeper level. Our Lord puts the argument as before. First of all, look at the facts, the lilies of the field, the natural wildflowers, the grass. 
The authorities again spend many pages in trying to decide exactly what a lily means. But surely he is referring to some common flowers which were growing in the fields of Palestine and with which they were all perfectly familiar. And he says, Look at these things. Consider. These do not toil, neither do they spin. And yet look at them. Look at the marvel. Look at the beauty. Look at the perfection. Why, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. The glory of Solomon was proverbial amongst the Jews. You can read of his magnificence in the Old Testament, the marvelous clothing and all the wonderful vestures of the king and his court, his palaces of cedar wood with their furniture overlaid with gold and encrusted with precious stones. And yet, says our Lord, all that pales into insignificance when compared with one of these. There is an essential quality in the flowers, in the form, in the design, in the texture and substance, and in the coloring that man, with all his ingenuity, can never truly imitate. To me, the meanest flower that blows can give thoughts that do often lie too deep for tears. That is what he sees. He sees the hand of God. He sees the perfect creation. He sees the glory of the Almighty. The little flower that is never perhaps seen during the whole of its brief existence in this world, and which seemingly wastes its sweetness on the desert air, is nevertheless perfectly clothed by God. That is a fact, is it not? If so, draw the deduction from it. If God so clothed the grass of the field, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? If God does that for the flowers of the field, how much more for you? But why is this so? Here is the argument. If God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? What a mighty argument this is. The grass of the field is transient and passing. In ancient times, they used to cut it and use it as fuel. It was the old way of baking bread. You first of all cut the grass and dried it, and then put it in the oven and set it on fire, and it generated great heat. Then you raked it out and put in the bread which you had prepared for baking. That was a common practice, and it was so in our Lord's day. So you see the powerful argument. The lilies and the grass are transient. They do not last very long. How well aware of this we are. We cannot make our flowers last. The moment we cut them, they are beginning to die. They are here today with their exquisite beauty and all their perfection, but it is all gone by tomorrow. These beautiful things come and go, and that is the end of them. You, however, are immortal. You are not only a creature of time. You belong to eternity. It is not true to say that you are here today and gone tomorrow in a real sense. God hath set eternity in the heart of man. Man is not meant to die. Dust thou art, to dust returnest, was not spoken of the soul. You go on and on and on. You not only have natural dignity and greatness, but you also have an eternal existence beyond death and the grave. When you realize that truth about yourself, can you believe that God, who has made you and destined you for that, is going to neglect your body while you are in this life and world? Of course not. If God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith?